What's up everyone, welcome back to another episode of Elder Scrolls Lore, and today we're going to be talking about the Skull. Now, before we begin, I'd like to th say thank you to Ares for allowing me to use his music, and then take a shout out to the Discord chat as well. Feel free to join in the link in the description below, or in the channel header. This is a community recommended topic, as I said in the last video. So, with that, we can just kind of hop in, there's not too much news other than the, my show, is, or the new series is coming up to a quick. We're coming up to a close. Um, just got to get a little bit more footage, and I got to do the voiceovers, and then um, I believe the music should be ready by now. Um, so, with that being said, uh, in terms of that too, as well, we also have the a new series, a new walkthrough going to be started up. Uh, I already have it recorded, edited, and everything, or now recorded and laid out. I just got to edit it, and that'll be done. So look forward to that as well. So we had a discussion about it in the Discord chat, so some of you might know, some of you might not. But with that being said, I hope you guys enjoy. Today we're going to be talking about the Skull. The Skull are a monotheistic society of Nords who inhabit Solstheim, which is now in the province of Morrowind, it used to be part of Skyrim. They are culturally and religiously different than their counterparts that are in Skyrim. Now within Skull culture, the villagers are provided according to need, as the Skull have little resources of their own. Because of this, theft is punishable by exile or sacrifice to the wolves. Now those who are exiled are never to be aided by the Skull again, even in their most dire of need. Contrary to when they are sacrificed, it is believed that their spirit is being purified and reborn. When young men of the Skull come of age, they are tasked with killing a Draugr single-handedly to prove that they are fit to be a man of the Skull. Now, the Skull follow a couple of strict laws, the aforementioned of them being one of them theft, the other being that uh, members should not attack each other unless it's self-defense, and the Skull themselves have strict punishments over, over their own members when committing these crimes, but if someone who is not of the Skull is guilty, their punishment is always death. The Shaman of the Skull is tasked with guiding and healing the fellow Skull while they're keeping their traditions of their, of their culture as well intact. Now this includes respecting nature and honoring the Allmaker. As I said, they're all monotheistic, so they believe in one god. Jogger are, are also hold a special position within the Skull. These, they believe basically that the Draugr were once mortal warriors who after being trapped and becoming hungry on the island resorted to cannibalism by eating their fallen comrades. The Skull believe that the Allmaker cursed them with undeath in an everlasting search for more flesh to consume. Another part of Skull culture inv involves Ristag. Now Ristag is a ceremony in which they, the land is blessed and cleansed and is only rarely performed. In order to summon the beasts needed for the Ristag, the Skull must use the Totem of the Claw Fang. Acquiring the Totem, the members of the Skull must summon beasts and perform ritual, the ritual hunts to please the Allmaker by showing him gratitude of, the, of their people by showing him gifts. Now, the Ristag takes place around nightfall and is, if it fails it, or does not succeed by daybreak, the Allmaker will be displeased with the culture. To officially end the Ristag, the heart of the Spirit Bear must be taken to the Skull Shaman. In regards to hunting, the Skull follow a specific mindset. First, they ask themselves if they need to kill the animal they are hunting, as the oneness of the land is preserved only by what, taking what the hunter needs. As such, the, the Skull do not hunt for sport, or merely, but merely to survive. They primarily hunt deer, bears, and horker, and always thank the Allmaker for giving them uh, access to the food like they have they've received and they do not bother any other animals to please the Allmaker. Now, as such of the fourth era, the Skull now hunt the Netch, a creature native to Morwind. The Netch provides the Skull with meat, bones, and uh, honor to the hunters who kill it. Wolves are hunted occasionally when their numbers form a threat to the village. Now, hunting parties for large game are led by the first hunter, who is usually the most skilled hunter of the group. Similarly, when the Skull collect firewood, they try to look for the wood of dead trees, as this harms the nature the least. The Skull are traditionally peaceful and will only resort to violence as a last option. Now, as I said, they are monotheistic, so they believe in one god, and this god is the Allmaker. And as 
namesake would have it, they believe that that this deity is the maker of all things. Upon death, the skull believe that the soul is returned to the Allmaker, and the Allmaker then sends it back to the world as a new creature. As such, the skull believe that death is not an end, but rather a new journey in life. Now, the adversary, also known as the Greedy Man, or Thartag, the World Devourer, is the... Well, have you, how you say it? The adversary of the skull. Now, it is implied that this is an aspect of her scene, and if not, her scene himself. When the skull grow lazy and take the land and the Allmaker's gift for granted, the adversary shape takes form, and the adversary is fond of disrupting the skull. The adversary can take on different shapes from beasts, diseases, to even humanoids, and if the skull neglect the Allmaker too long, the adversary is able to take away all the gifts of the Allmaker. And as the greedy man, the adversary is able to take away the gifts of the standing stones on Soul Slime as well until the skull comes to reclaim them. One of them at least. And now there are five standing stones. There is one of the water, land, trees, uh, bears, and wolves, I believe. So now the skull date back all the way to the Marathic era, and they are believed to have settled on Soul Slime at this time, back when they still followed the Dragon Cult and shared culture with the Skyrim Nords. Now, when the dragon priest known as Marak attempted to usurp the dragon cult, he was defeated by Valuk, the jailer, who would then rule Solstheim at the command of the dragons. It is believed that the Skull developed their own distinct culture from the Nords of Skyrim due to the separation from the mainland. During the War of the First Council in the First Era, in which the Nords of Skyrim were pushed out of Morwen, many Nords fell in the battle and those who could not return to Skyrim were brought to Solstheim to be buried. The Skull then used magics on the Nordic tombs to protect them from grave robbers and to keep corpses from turning worse. It is said that the Skull drew this magic from the land itself and encased the bodies in ice, which is now known as Stal Stalrim. Now, there isn't anything on the Second Era, but there is stuff on the Third Era. So in 327 of the Third Era, part of the Skull would abandon their village and create their own little settlement known as Thirskmead Hall when the people the Skull wanted to kill and, as they pleased and worship as they desired. Now, during the late Third Era, the Skull developed or disapproved of Fort Frostmoth and the Imperial Fort on the Isle, which is the Imperial Fort on the Isle. When Captain Folks Carius was captured due to her scene's hunt, the legionaries of Fort Frostmoth suspected the Skull knew more as werewolves involved the capture of the captain. When the Neverine arrived on the skull at the Skull Village, Tharsten Hartfang, the leader of the Skull, had assured him that the Skull were not involved. The Imperial Imperials had been cutting down trees and digging up the ebony ore of the island, and because of this uh, oneness they had, had, the Skull had to the land, they greatly disapproved and were significantly weakened by this effect. And additionally, the Imperials did not replant the trees for for the ones they chopped down and killed the wildlife without concern and as a result of this uh, the skull considered the Imperials short-sighted and foolish. To restore the balance of the land the Neverine had to visit all six standing stones and there were six not five I'm sure someone already typed in the comments by now oh there's, there's six not five blah 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 uh, and he had to get one for each of the one for each of the gifts of the Allmaker. Now following the successful completion of the first task the Heart Fang was convinced that the heart of never or heart of the Neverine was with the skull, but desired his mind to be with him as well. As such, he tasked the Neverine with investigating the crime, as Engar Icemane was accused of stealing furs from Rigmore Halfhand. In it would later turn out that Rignor himself was responsible due to the love he had for Risi Icemane, the wife of Engar. Now, following this, the uh, Neverine had to prove the one final thing to the skull and that was his strength. And then Neverine was tasked to meet the current shaman of the skull, Korst Windai at Lake Yalding for his new task. At the lake the shaman had discovered that the lake had been disturbed and a large fire had broken out on top of the lake itself. The skull's leader suspected a Draugr lord known as Aesilip, who was responsible for the fire, while the shaman believed it was a sign of the Blood Moon prophecy. Aesilip would turn out to be related to the event, but not the cause. He was housed under the lake, where, unlike the other Draugr who desired flesh, he performed a task. Aesilip had, a, had once been a mage for the skull, but when he delved into the black arts, he was cast out. Aesilip would then discover that a group of dire frost astronauts were planning to destroy the, the Skull Village, 
and removed life from the island. When the skull ignored Isolith's warning, the mage used his magics to create a, bar create a barrier within the ice to keep the astronauts from breaking free. Whether or not after Asylip's death would uh, the Echinox be defeated is not known. Following the death of Asylip, though, however, the lake still burned and the Neverine was tasked with returning to Skull Village. Not long after, uh, werewolves would attack the village and chaos would ensue. The Tharstan Heartfang was taken away by them and the Neverine aided them in fighting off the rest of the werewolves and he became infected with early stage of lycanthropy. In order to be cured of this, he continued to work alongside the Skull uh, upon curing the disease, the Neverine was known as the Blood Skull, a blood friend. Now, they then decided to perform the Ristag, and we kind of went over what the Ristag is already, so we won't go into that too much. And once it was completed, the Neverine would go on to save Captain Falk's Curious and defeat the aspects of her scene, as well as Karstag, which is a frost giant. And from there, the, um, the, blood, the blood Moon Prophecy would come to an end. In 201 of the Fourth Era, the first dragonborn known as Marak was attempting to cross back over into Tamriel. He did this through corrupting the standing stones of the land, and through this corruption, uh, managed to build up influence for himself. The leader of the Skull at the time was Fenari's strong voice, and the shaman was known as Storm Crackstrider. Now he was able to point the last dragonborn in the direction of Nerloth, of the Nerloth, eh, of Nerloth, in order to learn more about the Black Books. Now. After learning more about the Black Books and, and the means to stop Marak, Hermaeus Mora demanded the secrets of the Skull in return for his knowledge of the Ben Will Shout. Storm accepted to give up the secrets of the Skull to Hermaeus Mora, but Mora tricked him and killed him in the process. Now, at the same time, the smith uh, known as Balder Iron Shaper had gone missing. Uh, Dear Woodcutter, another member of the Skull, had seen two elves near the village dragging something away, but assumed they were just hunters. These elves would turn out to be members of the Thalmor, who had been sent to obtain the secrets of the smithing of Stalthrim. Now, though it is, they are un it is unknown whether or not they actually obtained this knowledge. During the late Fourth Era, the number of the Skull, skull were dwindling, uh, and because of the threats of the Skull, had, because of the threats the Skull had to face, uh, and their harsh way of life, they are speculated to find their end within the next couple centuries. Now. That is all we have today. We had quite of a lot there. I had to cut a little bit out um, in terms of what Daedra influenced the Skull as they were just myths and prophecies. Um, and they're not, it's not too sure whether or not they believe um, they had any influence on them, but regardless of which, I can go over them in a different video if you want me to, because that's a, another story itself. Uh, there's, a, there's a story about Hermaeus Mora and there's another one about her scene, but we kind of covered both of them in a sense. So. Uh, with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It's been a lot of fun to research the Skull. They're definitely a more interesting and a more unique group of the of the factions of Skyrim. Sorry, I'm like hiccuping as I'm doing this. But uh, as always, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this. And if you guys have any suggestions for future videos, let me know in the comments below or in the channel header. And I'll see you guys in the future. I don't think there's anything, anything else. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.